Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Weird Shit. Uh, so this is going to be episode 10, uh, and it's going to be all about rendering. Now, um, before we dive into it, uh, I want to give a little bit of an intro to this, uh, I guess, this episode and why it took so long to record. Um, I'll have a link below to skip straight to the tutorial. But um, basically, a uh, number of things. I've been trying to prepare for this one for quite some time, but the issue was that... Uh, Every time I'd make a scene to show render settings off, um, it doesn't really work out because they're specific to a scene, and that's exactly what I was trying to um, trying to avoid while making uh, while making this tutorial. Is that you use a specific scene to optimize render settings, and then everybody uses those settings because they think they're the optimized settings, but it doesn't actually work that way. It it works differently in that every scene is unique, and that your render settings can be tweaked to get the most out of your computer for every single scene and they might be different every single time. So um, couple that with the fact that it was sort of a heat wave uh, the last like month or so here and whenever I need to record, I need to you know record with my windows closed, pain in the butt, it was just too hot. So it's cooled down a little bit. Um, but um, yeah, what I ended up thinking about is what's the best way to convey uh, rendering and, and optimized render settings. And I figured I would just go through my defaults and sort of how I got there. And maybe try and make some very simple examples along the way that either will or won't work. Because um, like I said, it's very hard to always say this is gonna work exactly or not exactly. It's very, very scene dependent, light dependent, all that kind of thing. So I figured that might be more interesting uh, just to run through the re my render settings and why I use them and how I got there. And um, I think that might be a better idea. So with that said, let's dive straight into it. So let me just open up my render settings here. And um, the main ones I'm gonna focus on, I'm not really gonna focus on dimensions because obviously uh, size, you know, render a bigger size, it takes longer, that, that's about it. I mean, there's nothing much to say there. Keep in mind though, if you double up the render size, uh, for example, if you were gonna set this to 4K, so if we multiply both of these by two, then effectively we've got four times the amount of pixels because we've doubled two dimensions so your render time will be four times as long and not twice as long small little detail but something to consider um, resolution is extremely um, taxing on render settings or on rendering in general so we'll close that one up then the metadata is just to do stamps and stuff output again i'm not going to bother with that i'm going to start talking about sampling and um there's many different ways of uh, looking at sampling. And really, there's people that swear by path tracing. There's people that swear by bran branched path tracing. Honestly, both of them have their use cases. So again, even though I'm running through my render settings and why I have them set up this way, don't look at them as like the perfect render settings because they don't exist. I want to reiterate that as much as possible. It's just very scene dependent. Um, so I'm going to make some basic shapes and show you uh, how some stuff affects other things. And hopefully it will be clear. And if it's not, you know, it's what it is. I'm not going to be too worried about it. Just make some cubes and other things and maybe build uh, like a wall around them. Something like this. And of course, we can't have a Blender tutorial without Suzanne. So we're going to throw him, her in as well. Scale it up a little bit. There we go. And now we just have a basic scene we can test things on. And again, um, some things will be relevant to this uh, this tutorial, and other things won't be as relevant as to maybe your own scene. So sampling, actually, um, yeah, we'll stick with sampling for now. So. If you've looked at sampling, there's these two presets, final and preview. And um, honestly, to me, I don't really, I don't really use the uh, the defaults. As you might have noticed, um, I don't really use square samples because I find it you have to do math in your head. And even though they're down here, I just prefer knowing the amount of samples. Now I'm a huge nerd, so I always go for like these to the power of. Um, uh, two to the power of numbers. Now you don't have to do this, it really doesn't matter. Um, but one thing that might be important to have a look at, and let's see if we can load in an HDR here. I'll save my file first. Um, there we go. And, uh, and now we can load in an HDR. So I'm gonna grab one. 
I'm gonna grab one that I know is quite good, that gives me really nice results. So this courtyard one is uh, quite nice. I'm gonna throw it in here. So this is not, you know, if you don't know how to load in an HDR, this is basically the way to do it. Add an environment texture to your world. I'm just gonna pipe this down a little bit. Now, one of the things that um, people tend to say, and I mean, I've said this in courses as well, if you want to gauge your lighting, it's really good to have like a, a bright scene and it works in some cases and it doesn't in other cases. So I'm just going to move some stuff around. Uh, there we go. And maybe we can start doing things with this. Close this down here. And again, like I said, I tried to prepare this a lot, but I prefer to do these off the cuff. So if I make mistakes or things pop up that I didn't know, um, you can see, you can watch me solve them, which I think is more interesting anyway, uh, than just giving you this preset little whatever. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a principled shader to all of them. There we go. So this is just a regular white principled shader. I might even leave it white for now, and then we can have a look at how things affect other things. Then. I'm gonna put in a red Suzanne, and that will become clear Y in just a little bit. And then let's put in some glass because glass is always a fun thing. Um, no principle, there we go. Set the transmission to one. Bring down the roughness a little bit, and I'm gonna scale this up as well. Maybe not as big, but just so we have something to look at and to work with. All right, so now we've got a glass cube, Suzanne, and um, a white background. So this is a good little test bed and things, uh, something to try out. Now, the first thing you might look at, um, so I don't really use square samples, like I said, I just put typed them in uh, myself. And the reason they're at 256 is with the speed of my computer, I know I can do quick renders and I can get to 256 quite quickly, which is nice. Um, then the settings over here, the seed settings, this is one of those things, uh, I think by default it is set to non-animated, so it's off, uh, this will take us off right now. And uh, let me just reset the, uh, the theme really quick, because mine's a little bit dark and it might be hard to see. Let's go for flatty light, because that's the one everybody loves apparently. Um, so this is off right now, now it's on. So basically what this does, it will give you, when it's on, it gives you a different noise pattern every frame. Now, what's really important to remember, and we'll get into that with the denoising, is that if you want denoising to work well, you need to turn this off. Uh, if you're not gonna be using denoising and you don't mind that little bit of grain and you can turn it into something uh, that looks a bit more like film grain, then you want it on. So that's an important one to remember. But basically the noise will be different in each uh, frame. Now there's plenty of sort of render setting um, videos on YouTube, so you can look up the difference if you want to, but it's just good to know that it's there for a reason. Now, the clamping, this is one of those things that uh, you can do extremely scientifically. Um, there, I, I think it's Mike Pan, I can't remember who it was. Somebody did a blog post about how to calculate um, the perfect clamping settings and make sure they work really well. Now, um, the reason mine are at 10 and 7 is these are just values that I've found have worked for me uh, to start from over the, the last couple of years. Technically, if you want to have a perfect render, you don't want to be clamping stuff. And we don't really see anything right now. Let me maybe change this uh, into metallic. Turn on the roughness. Maybe up it a little bit. And the things that I've noticed, if you don't clamp, and again, it's very hard to, to produce a scene that will or won't do it um, because of the nature of how these things work, is clamping, generally, this is my biggest tool in fighting noise in an image. So if we just let this run to 256, and maybe we zoom in a little bit, you can see there's a lot of sort of noise and fireflies coming in here, and they're not even that bad. But if I were to clamp this down, maybe it will work and maybe it won't. And this is exactly why I'm talking about this being uh, very scene dependent. So it doesn't really have any effect. Now, what happens if I, let's say if I change Suzanne into an emissive object. So let's turn this up really high, just to give you an idea of what's going on. And uh, maybe add a camera into the scene as well. 
something we can have a look at. So we can render it out and we can compare things and stuff like that. So you see now with uh, everything that's going on, there's already a lot happening here. I'm just gonna move this up. So that way we can see the reflections, we can see Suzanne and we can see um, sort of, maybe move it back down a bit, a little bit. We can see some of the ref reflected refractions from within the cube. And all of this is really important because these are all very complex light paths that are working together to make this work. So now if I just render this, You can see there's quite a bit of noise in the image. Um, now, once again, I don't know if the light paths exactly are gonna, or I'm sorry, the clamping is exactly gonna stop this. So I'm gonna clamp down to the values that I use. I render it again uh, in slot two. There we go. And now if we compare, you'll see that in slot one, a couple, a couple of things have changed. Are there more fireflies? Yes, a little bit. But at the same time, the reflections are brighter. And if we have a look, uh, if I mouse over and click, look at the color values down here. So um, if I go down here, they're going to be within normal range. But the moment I go over to Suzanne, you'll see that R, G, and B down here, so keep an eye on it, is uh, value 40, 40, and 40. So we're getting the full kind of crazy emissive value that we were getting. And the same with the... Um, the reflections in here, they're really high value. So 25, and honestly, you can almost calculate it if you have the amount of reflection that your um, your object has and the light that's coming off the source. All this stuff is quite calculatable. But if we go to slot two now, you'll see stuff is dimmed down and you'll see that this is clamped at 10. And what that's all about, and we'll go back to that in a second, is this clamp direct value. So what you're doing is you're clamping the direct light coming from, um, from Suzanne that ends up in your render, so the, so the direct view of it. And um, you're clamping that down to 10. If we go to indirect, you'll see that's all around 6.97-ish. So again, what was my value? It was 7. So it's good to, to remember that um, when you're clamping this stuff down, you're basically setting an internal limit on the render engine of how bright things can be. So it will affect your scene. So if you start clamping stuff down, or you work unclamped at first, and then you start clamping stuff down willy-nilly, the look of your scene will change dramatically. Now this is a very simple scene, but you can see already how much it has changed. So this is one of the reasons why I like to set it up first and then work within those bounds and see if you can do stuff. But it's good to remember that things will happen, like you'll have to set your lights up really, really, really high values to get a minimum sort of extra bit of light because everything's being clamped down internally. Now it's always gonna be a trade-off. Um, like I said, uh, the clamping is very specific to, um, to your scene. So depending on what the brightest object is in your scene, there are um, ways of figuring out the optimal way of, um, of doing this. But I just wanted to show you this, that just don't start putting in any values. The reason I've come to this 10 and seven value that I've used for a while, um, it's because it gave me a good sort of middle ground uh, I found in working with a lot of emissive objects and other things and getting the noise out. So again, this is unclamped and this is clamped. This is definitely something to remember um, and to keep an eye on. For me, like I said, this is my main tool to bring down fireflies a little bit, um, but it does affect your scene uh, quite a bit. It basically just limits your render engine. It tells it, all right, you can only have light values, direct light values up until 10, and indirect light values up until seven. So things will darken down a little bit, but again, the trade-off is that you have less noise. So think about that kind of thing. Um, another thing, and let's go back to our render view. This is the last one, and I believe in 2.8, they might hide this one again. I've set this to correlated multi jitter and the default noise pattern is Sobol. Now, 99.9% .9 of people probably won't even see this, it's just a different type of noise pattern. Um, they don't really make a difference. I believe col col colorated, correlated multi-jitter um, adds like one or two seconds to your render. But that doesn't bother me. It's just a different type of noise pattern. Um, that's all it is. I, I personally like the look of the other one when I process it, when I add filters on top of it and compositing. But honestly, just leave it to Sobol. It doesn't really matter. Um, again, 
this is a very, very personal preference. And if you are using this one, um, I believe, I don't know if it's still the case, but I remember reading way back when, you need to have an even number of samples uh, to get a good result. But that might have been changed so far, I'm not sure. But again, don't worry about it. Sobol is fine, it's not affecting anything really. Now the next one is um, geometry. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add in a mesh, I'm just gonna add in a round cube to encapsulate this entire scene. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give this a volume shader. So I'm gonna smooth this out and I'm gonna set this view to bounce. So that way we can see it and I don't really need to select it in my scene. Right now, if I'm gonna render, nothing's gonna happen. With the round cube selected here, I'm gonna make a new thing. And I have a little group that I've made uh, for volume. Now, this is still 2.79B. If you're watching this in the future, 2.8 has a principled volume shader, which basically does something very similar to what I've created here. Just allows me to put, to take away the surface and to um, have one unified volume shader without having to mix it all together. So just to show you, this is all it is. It's very simple. I have a group input, I have an add shader to bring these together, and then I have a transparent shader to kill the surface. And that transparent shader isn't even needed in most cases, but it's good to know that it's there. So now we have uh, volume. The other way of doing it is having volumes in, sorry, in your world. But I found that if you put them in here, you can't actually see the um, HDRI bleeding through. So I usually do it this way, uh, also because I have more control over how big the volume is. But either way is fine, it doesn't really matter. But again, um, what I wanted to show is if we go back and I'm gonna put in slot number four, and let's add in some metadata. So we'll turn on the stamps and let's see. So this is the default step size and the maximum steps. Um, I'm not 100% sure if the maximum steps actually work with regular path tracing as it's only branched, but we'll have a look. So we'll render the scene first. And this is going to take a little while once again. And actually, I'm just going to stop this and change it back because I want um, Suzanne to be non-emissive. So that way she's not affecting the volume. So now we can just see a very misty sort of, uh, sort of thing. So that was my mistake. Bring down the absorption. Oh, bring it down rather. There we go. Now we just have a very basic uh, misty scene. So let's render that again. All right, so that's that done. Uh, you can see it took about one minutes, one minute and 44 seconds. And uh, let's see if we can get this optimized. Now, this step size is really gonna make a bigger difference uh, when you're doing things like smoke sims and other things. But I just wanted to show you to see um, if we can get, let me switch to the other slot before I forget. There we go. And we can get this render time down. Now I find volumetrics and cycles one of the harder things to optimize um, simply because there's not that much control. And um, yeah, at the end of the day, it's just a really, really crazy calculation. Now there's other things you can do like only um, mix in the volume uh, for the camera rays and other things, but I like the look that the full on volumetrics give me. So the step size is, the way to think about this is Basically what's happening is your volume from the camera point of view is being sliced into different pieces. And the step size is basically the slice, you know, the distance between the slices. This isn't 100% accurate the way I'm, uh, I'm explaining it, but it's the best way to sort of remember it. So if you're gonna increase the step size, it's gonna take less slices within that volume. So it's gonna have less data. So it's gonna have to um, calculate a lot less and um, that way it should become faster. Now that means that you're also gonna lose a lot of detail. So again, this is more apparent when you're using it for uh, smoke sims and other things. And we'll see, I don't even know if it's gonna have that much of an effect on what we're doing here. So I increased the step size to one just to see if there's a big uh, difference. And let's set this to 16. Again, I'd have to double check if this is with path tracing or just uh, branched path tracing. That's what the documentation is for. So. Let's render again. And you can immediately see that didn't make any difference. So this is exactly um, 
why I'm doing this the way I'm doing this is now you can see that some of these settings, they don't have a difference at all. So these really only pertain to, um, you can see it's exactly the same. I'm switching between the renders and you know, there's absolutely nothing has changed. So that's good to know um, because that means these settings really uh, have more of an effect on um, just smoke sims. And I haven't done a lot of smoke sims lately. And this is the reason why these are also still default and I haven't changed them because I found that it doesn't really matter. Now, um, the next one is the subdivision rate. And this work is uh, where things get interesting. So I'm just gonna add some adaptive subdivision to this. Uh, leave the levels at zero. And then let's see if we can add some displacement in. Um, let's do a Voronoi texture because they're always fun. Let's see, that'll give us some interesting results. So um, always make sure that cycles is set to experimental when you're using the uh, displacement, especially in 2.79. And then the only thing that's left to do is in our settings, we need to tell it that the tr displacement is true. Now I'm gonna add in a math node here. See, there we go. Maybe crank it up just to overdo it a little bit. And I'm also going to hide that noise. There we go. Let's see what happens if we crank this up to 10. There we go. So um, if you look at the way this looks right now, this is being controlled by the preview. So the way the subdivision rate setting works is basically what uh, Cycles is going to try and do is subdivide your object until polygons are the size of X amount of pixels. So if you look at this preview render and you compare it to when I actually hit render, you'll see, or you should see at least, um, if I bring up the max subdivisions, you'll see that this has a lot sharper of an edge. Now, you can debate away whether uh, you want to do sub-pixel displacement or a pixel displacement. I believe the default is set to 1. Now, the reason I set it to 0.75 is that I've noticed in certain animations, um, if you have static objects like a big landscape that you've used displacement on, you fly over it with a camera, for example, um, I've noticed setting the displacement to 1 means that you'll get little jumps here and there depending on where the camera is. And if you set it to a sub-pixel value, like 0.75, you'll actually get um, displacement that will stay the same uh, throughout the shot. Now again, this is very shot dependent, but I know I have the RAM in my computer to be able to do this, so that's why I set it lower. Generally, for still images, if you set it to one, you should be fine. I've noticed that for animations, setting it a little bit lower than one, even 0.9, can alleviate a lot of little pops and ticks and weird things. Now. The other thing that you notice is I had to set up my max subdivisions. Now, by default, I believe these are set to 12, but I, um, as some of you might know, if you've seen the other tutorials, I work a lot with modifiers and I have a lot of geometry that's generally already very heavily subdivided. And um, for example, I'll have a lot of the cases I'll have a subsurf modifier already on top of an, on top of an object. And because I'm setting my, um, my subdivision rate to such a small pixel size I actually control it's sort of a bit of a sanity check by setting it only to four so that way i know when it's hitting the limit so in this example what was happening earlier is actually because of that so if we turn this off we just have this cube so if you subdivide that four times well, let's just show you real quick this is the amount of polygons that you would get so if you turn this off and uh, we set this to four then you'll see, and hopefully this will work, if we put in a wireframe. I don't know if this will work, but we'll have a look. Yeah, so you'll see that's exactly what happened. It is subdivided and it can only go so far. If we now bring this up, let's say we set this up to six, then you'll actually see the subdivisions at work and you'll see now it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So this is something very important to remember. Um, that if you are already working with geometry that has a lot of polygons, then you want to make sure that you're not going overboard because um, when you're using displacement, this is like the number one cause of crashes is you just start running out of memory. 
So that's why I've set these to four. By default, I believe they're on 12. And let's see what happens. Now you see, because I'm set to lower than one polygon, these are, it's very hard to tell how big the polygons are. Maybe if we set the size even smaller of the wireframe. There we go. It's almost impossible to tell, but you can see there's so many of them, they're blending together. And that's when you have to start wondering, like, is there really a point to having it this dense, especially in animations? So that's what I was referring to earlier with the trick with the, um, the way it calculates the displacement is smaller than a pixel, which is good, but your polygons can still be a little bit bigger because of the subdivision, but that way you'll have less popping and less changing. So keep stuff like that in mind. Again, if I set this back down to four, we're back to where we were, where you can see that it only subdivides it a little bit. So that's a really good control. And the reason why I've set it up this way, because now let's say if I want to turn this on and I want to do some initial displacement first, so where's my displace modifier? There we go, put in a texture and let's mess with the texture here. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Now what we'll see is that because it already been displaced, this is kind of a good, good middle ground. We're getting um, both the original displace and then our uh, subdivision, like our micro displacement on top. So, um, Good control, and it's better to have this a little bit too low and have to crank it up than to have this really high and wonder why your computer is crashing every single time you try to um, add displacement on top of it. So let's turn these back off. Or actually, we can keep them on, it doesn't really matter. And again, you can see um, the difference between the 2.5. So if I make this here, um, it's not gonna subdivide them as much as the final render. So it's good to know that you can have uh, different controls. Also, a little quick thing, you can even change it here as well. So if you have ob objects in the background and you're like, well, they're not really gonna move and it's just a static shot or whatever, um, then you can up the dicing scale to make sure to, that it's like maybe even bigger than a pixel or two pixels. Um, because let's say it's in the background, it's out of focus, nobody's really gonna notice if, you know, your subdivision, like your, your subdivision dicing is really fine or not. So again, it's all things to consider. Um, so that's that. Now hair, this is actually kind of important because you can do some really cool stuff with hair. And I'll make an extra little object here. Uh, let's make a circle. There, and I forgot to fill it up. Edit mode, fill, there we go. I'll just move this up a little bit. There we go. Add in a hair system and render it out. And then let's crank up the thickness and do stuff with hair you're not supposed to do, but um, it'll become clear what all of this stuff is for. So now I've got these hairs and um, I've used hair in many different cases. And especially if we now add in something like a force field Actually, not a force field. Or we can just change it in here. A turbulence field. So I tend to use this a lot for different things. And let's add some steps into this. We get some interesting looking shapes. There we go. This is just a very basic example. But what I want to show you is um, if you get really close to the hair here, you can see there's little splits in it. So if you want to use this in a shot and really and get really close to it, you actually have to start messing with some of these settings here. So there's multiple ways of looking at it. So the line segments is the default, and for most cases this works really well and it's quite optimized. Another thing you might notice is that you can look straight through the hair, and that's because the back faces are being called. So if you turn this off, now all of a sudden they become solid. The only thing is we're still getting these little stripes and that's because it's using line segments. Switching this to curve segments tends to help because now it's looking at the hairs themselves as curves, but you can already see how much slower it's starting to render. So again, this is another uh, trade-off, but if you need to get really close, then, um, then switching it to curve segments can really help. Um, actually, we'll wait for that with a second. The last one is triangles and now it's trying to make a mesh out of things, but it, as you might notice, um, with some of these really weird shapes, it has a hard time meshing them. They break, they turn inside out, and it's just a limitation of the method. It's not a bad thing or anything, but 
I've usually found the best results either with the line segments, the default if I'm far enough away. So from here, you can't really see that they're split up. They just look all right. Or the curve segments if I'm going in closer. That's definitely something to consider. Um, but again, the curve segments are obviously a little bit slower. Now you've got other options in here as well is just to make the uh, hair into ribbons, which is really cool because then it's just a single sort of flat plane that's being, uh, being extruded along the curve. And again, um, you can see the difference between the line segments and the curve segments. Line segments will be a little bit blockier sometimes, but it's all about when you get super close. So here is a very good example of how that sort of messes up. Go back into the curve segments and that should be a little bit better. Again, you can see it's way, way slower. So again, now the curves are nice and smooth. And if we go into triangles, um, they're actually quite fast and they work quite well in this case, in, in the ribbons case. So just try them out, see what it does, but I can see some stuff flipping here already that might not be perfect for what you wanna do. So that's why I leave these to the defaults. Um, they work quite well, no big deal. And the call back faces is, uh, you know, if you wanna show the back faces or not, which can be good in some cases. So in these line segments, if we go here, you can see really well what it's doing. With call back faces off, this is a complete circle. With call back faces on, it's only the uh, part that's facing you. So it's good to know. Now the minimum pixel value, um, I don't really mess with at all because I haven't really, let's see. I haven't really seen much to gain from it. I think it, this is really when you're working very small hairs, um, which I don't always tend to do. It might, oh yeah, there we go. It's already changing some stuff. So now the minimum size for a hair is 10 pixels, but you can see it does weird things to it. And generally I just leave it uh, deactivated and the um, maximum extension that strand radius can incre be increased by. I'll be brutally honest, I have no idea what this does. So I might learn something as well today, but No, nope, not really doing anything. So that's why I left it at the default. Um, it doesn't really seem to affect anything in this case. There might be somebody out there that knows what it's doing. So they can comment below and tell me that I'm an idiot and I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, all right, so that's the geometry part. Now the light paths. And uh, actually before I go on to the light paths, there's one more thing I wanna say up here about the tracing and the branched path tracing. Now I find it really weird that I'll meet people that swear by either one or the other. Um, really, they're, again, very, very scene dependent, very situation dependent. So with the branched path tracing, I usually end up using branched path tracing when I'm using, uh, when I'm on a machine that only has a CPU available to it and when you're doing like really heavy scenes. So if you've got a scene with all kinds of different shaders and all these amazing things uh, inside of it, like characters, foliage, backgrounds, buildings, like a full, like full on film pipeline scene, then branched path tracing might be more interesting to use um, because you get a lot more control over all the individual elements. So generally you'll use this uh, in conjunction with your render passes and then go have a look at all the different render passes as you're um, rendering them out. So I'm talking about all of these to render all of them out and then go look at the passes individually to figure out where the noise is and where you can add some samples and take some samples away to really optimize it. Now, I'm usually rendering on GPUs and just the speed and efficiency of using path tracing for me beats having to figure stuff out here and um, I don't mind letting things run a little bit, a little bit longer. Um, and that pipes very nicely into the performance settings down here, or sorry, the light path settings down here. So again, this is purely preference, but one isn't better than the other. It's just more suitable to a different situation. And don't get fooled by people's magic render settings. They don't exist. Good defaults exist and knowing what you're doing. That's more important than anything else when it comes to rendering and knowing how rendering works. So I'm gonna turn this back metallic off a little bit. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, um, the light paths. Now, light paths are incredibly, incredibly important in knowing how your scene works and basically to have a good idea of um, how rendering works in general. Now cycles, as you might've heard before, is called uh, is what's called a path tracer. So that means what's happening, um, and there's a great video online as well on YouTube from Disney about their rendering engine. Um, what, I think it's called an introduction to, to path tracing and ray tracing. If you look that up, it's really good. 
And it just explains to you that the way this image is being calculated um, is we're taking the camera's point of view, we're shooting rays out from the camera and it's hitting everything in the scene and it's bouncing them off everything, trying to figure out how everything is connected uh, light wise. So for example, this is super, super red and this might not be crazy visible, you can, but you can see there's some red bounce a little bit on the, um, on the white here and the amount of red bounce you'll have really depends on your path tracing, uh, your light paths. So what I'm going to do is actually work a little bit backwards for this one and select my camera, move that over just a bit so we have something to look at here in the middle. I'm not going to worry about what it looks like, I'm just going to worry about what everything does. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the default. So this is limited global illumination. These caustics are off and um, we have minimum and maximum values that are very simple. So let's go to another slot here. Let's go to slot seven and render it out. And this is a very simple scene, but you're already going to see a lot of differences. And now these are messed up because I didn't change the, uh, the settings for the rendering, but we're not going to worry about that too much. So this is the default settings. And we're just going to let it run. There we go. And then we're going to go to slot eight. And then we're going to go to the other extreme uh, with full global illumination. So that basically enables everything and sets these bounces up to be kind of insane. But um, again, what I want to do, making sure I have the right slot, I'm going to render this and then we're going to compare the two and actually see what kind of effect this has on everything. And you might be surprised that this is one of those render settings that doesn't get talked about a lot, but really means a lot for your scene and can really make a huge difference. So I'll shut up now and let it render. All right, and with that done, the first thing you might have noticed is this has taken a lot longer. So um, if we go back to slot seven, you'll see this rendered in 23 seconds and this rendered in 58 seconds. But another thing that you'll notice is this is quite dark and contrasty. And especially if you look at these hairs um, and sort of in this corner, when I switch back oh, to the other one, you'll see this is a lot brighter. Now, for some weird reason, a lot of people tend to say that this looks better. Now, I personally don't agree. I think this looks a lot more natural because the light has had its chance to bounce around. Um, now, I've seen, like in the past as well, see some bit more of that red on the ground here, just a little bit. It's tinting it. It's not as extreme as you might think it is. But I remember reading all these articles on people, how to get rid of this bleeding of these colors into each other. But that bleeding is actually very natural and make things makes things look very realistic. This this looks like an image that's already been over-processed, but it is faster. So what I'm trying to explain here is there's two things that are really important, and I don't know if we'll be able to see that. So again, if we look at this, for example, which has refractions in it, look how dark this is looking and look how light this is looking in, in comparison. You'll also notice that there's some more black in here that wasn't in there before. Um, while if we go to the version with everything opened up, and you can see this looks a lot more natural, a lot more like light wood. And this is down to a number of things. Now, first off, um, I'm going to leave the transparency uh, for what it is, but I'm going to set the bounces. Let's set the bounces down to one and see how that affects everything. So, oh crap, I should have not rendered it. But anyway, that's fine. I'll just uh, explain it while it's rendering. Overwrote the other one by accident, but that's okay. Um, so now you can see what the bounces are doing. So all my bounces set to one. So what happens? Light arrives on this thing and it just goes, all right, this is reflective and that's it. It can't get through the object anymore, through the refraction anymore. It can't show the back anymore because all of the bounces just aren't happening. So basically what you're doing when you're controlling bounces in your scene is you're telling cycles how how much the light can just keep bouncing around and keep changing within the same scene. Now, even if we compare that to the uh, the defaults that we were looking at earlier, you can notice a few results immediately. Obviously, the black here. And if you look closely to over here, there's some differences in the uh, in the reflections as well. So let's bring this back to the defaults. And then what I want to do is I want to make a render with and without reflective caustics. 
And even though these tend to be kind of a, another reason that you might have noise, um, they also make your reflections and refractions generally look a little bit brighter, a little bit more crisp, a little bit nicer. So I guess what I'm trying to say here in a really sort of long-winded way is that faster rendering isn't always better. Sometimes you have to sacrifice the time to get a better image. It's just the way it is. If you start limiting a render engine, what it can and can't do, then obviously you're going to have to correct some of this stuff with post-processing, and it's not always going to look too great. And that's something I really try to avoid. I don't mind waiting a little bit longer for something that comes out a lot nicer looking than um, something that comes out and just kind of looks like butt and you have to try and make it look good. So we'll see how much this affects, especially on these uh, simple settings, how much this will affect this object. You won't see it quite as much on the other ones. Now let's zoom in a little bit and let it finish real quick. So if we go back to slot one, and this is exactly what I'm talking about. Now again, this is all just my personal preference, but I do think, oh, if we go to slot one, this is the default settings without the caustics, um, and this is the sort of the, my settings with the caustics, and I find that this looks a lot better. I've had a lot less problems with um, with reflection, uh, refractions and reflections in general and rendering them out since I've turned this stuff on because you get stuff that just kind of feels more right. It feels more in tune with what you would expect from it. So um, these two are really important. Now filter glossy, I tend to shy away from because it does filter stuff out and it can help a little bit with fireflies, but it takes away detail. And I'll get into that a little bit later as well. Now. My settings are, if we go to this full global illumination, you saw that the render time almost tripled and it's a bit too much. So I do like a lot of transparency because I, I um, work with a lot of glass and stuff in my renders. So I'll put this somewhere between 32 and 64. And I found that actually let's leave this at what it was and we'll do another test render just to see, just to compare. Um, my settings with the with cycles basically going all out. Setting this to full global illumination basically amounts to you telling cycles, all right, do the best you can do, go completely nuts with, with rendering and render it as accurately and as you know brightly and beautifully as you possibly can. So we'll let this run and then we'll compare it with my sort of optimized settings that are somewhere in between the defaults and here that I find are a nice comparison of um, like a nice balance of speed and looks. So, All right, so that's uh, cycles all out. Can we actually read this? We cannot. So we're just gonna remember this is 58 seconds and then we'll go to slot four. And my stuff, like I said, is somewhere in between. So I believe I have 32 bounces here and then 16 for each one. Leave the caustics on and hit render again. All right, there we go. So it proved to be about a second faster, which honestly isn't really that much. Um, but again, it's very scene dependent. This is a very simple scene. If you have a lot more stuff going on, you will notice it. Now. The more important part is if I switch between the two and I'm doing so the whole time, you can't actually see a single difference. So that's what I meant by optimized settings. This is sort of to make sure that Cycles doesn't completely run amok with uh, complex scenes with a lot of reflections and refractions and all that kind of thing. Um, and in this one, it doesn't make much of a difference. But again, if we go to the defaults and we go to the other settings, it's up to you, but I definitely prefer the look of the more brighter stuff. and. Again, um, one of those typical things is contrast. If you want contrasty images, it's easier to put it in afterward than have to take it out um, if it's too contrasty uh, and too dark. So yeah, that's what these are all about. These are, I guess, my kind of optimized settings. As you can see, it does take longer. Some of my renders do take quite a long time even with a very beefy machine, but I do believe that this is the better way to go. You want your renders to be as beautiful as they can before you start compositing. You don't wanna go into compositing trying to fix stuff that's too dark with extra passes and you're just giving yourself a lot of work. All that time you could've, that you're putting in, you could've just cranked up your render settings a little bit, be happy with the result that comes out and have less work afterwards to make it look exactly the way you want it to look. So it's very important and I feel like it doesn't really get talked about a lot. 
Now, um, motion blur is motion blur. Don't worry about it. You can turn it on or off. Uh, do know that it significantly, significantly impacts your render time, more so than anything else, really. Um, then if we go into film, there's not really much here. Uh, I leave these default. Like I said, if you want a transparent background, turn on transparent. Other than that, not really big reasons for changing this. If you want really sharp stuff or no AA, you can turn this to box and then turn the width to one. Um, but you know, you always want a Gaussian will make things a little bit more fuzzy, uh, a little bit softer. Blackman Harris will make things sort of in between uh, as far as I understand it. So not really much there. Now performance, you can talk about this stuff all day, every day, but really honestly, um, in 2.79B, so the final version of 2.7, uh, or maybe there's a C, but cycle's not gonna change. What's important to know is that if you're rendering on GPU, you want sort of like bigger tile sizes, so around um, 256 pixels, 512 pixels, somewhere around there is ideal. And if you're rendering on CPU, if I change it up here, you'll also see it immediately changes. You want like 16 or 32 as a tile size because um, otherwise it's going to take a lot longer. Now, I know with 2.8, um, if you're watching this in the future, a lot of this stuff is fixed and you can combine CPU and GPU and that's all really cool, but I'm not going to do that in this video because I want to keep it to the current version and um, that way I can do a follow-up video in the future and people can refer back to this if necessary. So um, this is really nice. Uh, I have this little add-on that... Um, it's called auto tile size. And I think most people know about this, but what it does, it just basically sets it, um, sets the tile size depending on the type of device that you're using. So you don't have to worry about it even, and you can set it up. Um, then I don't really change a lot of this stuff, mostly because I haven't found that much of a, of a use for it in my work. I'm sure there's other people that are able to use some of this more advanced stuff and really get everything out of cycles but for me I haven't really found the need to change a lot of things the only thing that I might change is the start resolution and that's basically um, if you set this really low and you can see exactly what's going on you see how and it's rendering a little bit too fast but you can see how it's all blocky at first yeah, if you set this higher so like if you set this to 512 and this is very extreme you'll get almost your full image without any blockiness so this can be really nice for when you're changing shaders so for example, if I put in a uh, color map here or just uh, anything, let's see, let's do brick texture. It won't look very good, but if this is set to, I believe the default is 64 and you're trying to tweak this texture, then you can see it's very hard to see what you're doing. It's very annoying. If you set this up higher, it's like 256 or whatever, um, because it will start from a sort of less pixelated uh, and a bigger resolution, you can actually work with the maps in real time. Um, 512 is a little bit extreme, but again, sometimes it's, it can be useful because now I get a live preview of this map and for me, it's easier to work. So that's probably the only thing that'll change a lot. Um, you can mess around with these. Progressive Refine is cool, but the render is actually slower. So basically what that does is, um, if we go back here, go to slot five real quick. If we turn on Progressive Refine, it won't use buckets, but it will do just a pass every every time. But this is definitely slower. And even if you hover over it, it tells you that the render time is slower. So, um, and then these two, I don't really look at uh, because that's to turn on the compositing and the sequencer it doesn't really have much to do with rendering and the baking. I'm not really a guy that bakes a lot of stuff. So there's people more qualified than me to uh, to get into that. So um, now there's something else I want to talk about as well. And I can't remember. Yeah, I mentioned something about the sampling here as well. And um, one of the things I want to talk about is denoising. So when the denoiser got put in, everybody's like, oh my God, I can render things with three samples and it still looks great. And in some cases, yes, it does. But in a lot of other cases, um, denoising can get really, really blotchy. So what I want to do now is just render these scenes at very low sample rates just to kind of show you what happens. So let me set this to 32 samples and let's see. And I'll just turn on the denoising as is and make sure my Suzanne has stuff in here and I'm going to put that color in the roughness so we have something to look at. So 
So now we're rendering and we're going to start denoising. And at first glance, the result might kind of look okay, but when we zoom in, you can see it gets super, super splotchy. And especially in here, there's all kinds of stuff going on that you really don't want in a final render. Now, another thing that I mentioned before is that the seed need to, needs to be turned to the same, uh, doesn't, can't change when you're using denoising. So I always have this turned on by default, so I always have to remember to turn this stuff off. Um, so if we go to slot six, because it does help, I don't know how much it's gonna help in this case, but at least we can compare. So I'll let this render again. There we go, that's that. And if we change it, you can see it helped a little bit, but not all that, that much. Um, it's generally more useful in animations, so the noise pattern doesn't jump and the blotchiness doesn't show. But denoising is great, but it doesn't always, it's not always suited to what you're doing. So don't just turn it on and don't think about it, because there's actually a lot of stuff that you can change about it, which is very important. Um, so first of all, what do you want to be denoising? Um, we're going to skip these top for a second and just talk about this here. Sometimes you just want to denoise different channels. So in most cases, when I'm using denoises, uh, denoising, I'm only going to be no denoising subsurface, because Diffuse Colossian transmission generally converges with a lot less samples and looks pretty good with a lot less samples than subsurface does. So I'll just use it on subsurface and then I'll tweak the settings up here. Um, now we're gonna leave these all on, but it's good to know that there's so much more control than just turning on denoising, that's it. The radius, honestly, I haven't found um, a big difference. So let's just turn up the radius and we'll try and see if we can get, actually, I'm gonna turn off denoising and I'm gonna start at slot one so we can just start from the beginning and have a look at um, how well it actually works. And we're gonna go for eight samples, which is too little to begin with, but that way it'll hopefully be clear uh, the amount of stuff we can actually tweak to make it look good. So I'm just gonna do a raw render with eight samples really quickly. There we go. And then we're gonna switch to slot two. And I'm gonna turn on the denoising on default settings. And now we have two reference images we can start um, we can start exploring and seeing if we can get a better result from the denoising. So because this is extremely noisy, you're never gonna get a perfect result, but it'll be interesting to see how the different uh, settings actually affect it. So the first thing you can do, and actually this isn't, there we go, that wasn't default, so I'm gonna set it back to eight and re-render real quick. And now let's just increase the radius to something ludicrous and you'll see what kind of effect it has. And I did it in slot two again. All right, sorry for all the, uh, for all the re-rendering here, at least it's fast. So we're in slot two, so this is just the default of eight. And I think I typed in 32, but it went to 25. So there's a maximum radius of 25, see, that I didn't even know, so. Make sure we're in slot three, yep. So now let's actually compare those two and see what it does. As you can immediately see, a lot of this detail in the hair is completely lost and it starts getting really fuzzy and weird. Now we increased increase the search radius of the denoising to 25 pixels. So that's quite a big patch that it's gonna use um, and yes, things are smoother, but you can see the details are getting all messed up. Now, um, let's go to slot four and change this back to eight and set the strength to maximum. And again, it's just about exploring what all these settings do. So now you'll see we get some of that detail back, but the strength of the denoising is making it look very blotchy and weird. And this is a very typical thing that I've seen in a lot of renders lately, is that people just turn on the denoising, they don't worry about it, and they might just crank up the strength because they're like, yeah, then everything's denoised, and you get these really weird blotchy renders. And this is extreme and it's exaggerated for this, um, this thing, but have a good look at your renders because sometimes a little bit of noise, but having all the detail in your render that you can maybe mask with just some softening or a simple filter at the end of your compositing stack is a lot better than just denoising the entire image. Now, another thing that's really important here, and let's go back to slot five so we can render that, is the feature strength. So what the feature strength does is you're basically gonna tell it 
what to focus on. So right now it's in the middle. So it's just going to try and do a good average denoising job. If you tell the features, if you set this to like 0.2, we're going to tell the, the denoiser is like keep as many small details as possible and not worry about the bigger ones. So we'll set this to one end of the spectrum and then to the other end of the spectrum, sort of see how that affects the denoiser and the image. We might not see a lot in this image, but we might get some really interesting effects at the same time uh, to compare. So on slot five and seven, so let's set this to like 0.8. So now it's going to focus on the big details. And we can immediately see a difference. So with the, this is the defaults, and this is a smaller relative uh, strength size, or whatever, whatever it's called. And you can see sort of a few little differences here and there. So this is regular, sorry, this is regular, and this is the uh, smaller thing. So now it's going to try and focus on the smaller, um, smaller details. And this is, if you set the relative, I believe it's a uh, feature strength, sorry. So if you set the feature strength to a lower value, this is good when you have a render that's already quite clean, but you just want to denoise a little bit of the, the like the, the details and other things. And then if we go to the other end of the spectrum, you can see it's just trying to smooth out the image in really big chunks. So you get, you lose a lot of your detail and, um, you know, as an artistic effect, this might work, but I wouldn't really count on it to uh, produce a uh, good result every time. So this is really important to know. This is a very, very, um, I guess, good one to tweak. And I've had very good results by just bringing the feature strength down or up a little bit, depending on the scene. Um, so if you're going to use the denoiser, experiment with this a lot and with the strength as well. Um, then the relative filter is... Uh, a different kind of threshold. So you can see when moving pixels that don't carry information, use a relative threshold instead of an absolute one. So this can help with um, artifacts. So again, let's go to our renders and I believe slot four was just the regular one. So if we go to slot seven, we're gonna compare four and seven by just turning off the relative, uh, turning on the relative filter. Um, it says it can mess with the edges. So if you have uh, edges that need anti-aliasing, you can see sometimes they can be a bit more rough if you're using that one. So, so we actually see a lot of difference in this scene. Doesn't really make a lot of difference. We're going closer, maybe. Yeah, there's some some difference, but again, this is very very scene specific, and you can always turn it on and off to see if it does have a positive result. But as you might have noticed so far, as we're coming towards the end of this, uh, this tutorial, is rendering is all about rendering and re-rendering and tweaking your settings. Like I said, there's no magic thing that will fix everything. There's no one button that you're like, all right, this is fine. And um, it's all about knowing what this stuff is about and looking up about it and reading about it. And I've read a lot, read up a lot about how path tracers work because you know, I'm just interested in it in general, but it's good to know because if you know how to tweak things, you're gonna get the best result a lot quicker. So that's uh, just one one more thing. Now, one last thing you can do uh, is if you really wanna get into it and you really wanna tweak um, your render is, uh, as I said before, I'm just gonna render this real quickly. It doesn't matter if it's denoised or not denoised, but if you wanna figure out what's causing noise in your scene, and actually I shouldn't have denoised it because then the result will be clear. So let me just turn it off again and render it. If you want to figure out where all the noise is coming from, um, you can go through these passes. So you can see in the diffuse direct pass, oh, diffuse indirect. So the indirect light in this case is causing for a lot of noise. Um, and the indirect glossy pass isn't really too bad. Indirect uh, transmission is usually quite uh, quite noisy, and there's no subsurface in our scene. So that's the best way to really debug a render is to render out the passes and just go through them one by one and have a look. Okay, so what's the one that's causing the most noise? Probably, probably this one. So diffuse indirect. So for example, what we can do is just denoise the indirect diffuse. There we go, and it'll start denoising it. And you can see, even though we still get um, noisy results, you can still see that blotchiness of the denoising doing its thing, but because it's only doing it in one channel, 
um, you can really control where where you need to do it. So that's a great way of doing things, just turning them on a mission environment and all that stuff. And then you can see exactly what's going on in your render, where the problems are. Um, it might be a rogue shader somewhere that's causing too much light to bounce or to reflect, and then uh, you can find it immediately. Now, one very last thing I wanna to touch on very quickly is the color management settings. Now, I've set this to filmic and high contrast by default. Why? I just like the way it looks. People can debate about this endlessly. Um, filmic has a really nice range. Uh, it really distributes the colors in a better way. So, for example, if we just go to that last render, you can see, if I set this to none, uh, we can compare it to the default. The default is quite punchy and a little bit too contrasty, and it's very hard to work within that color space because it's quite, um, quite limited and filmic helps with that and um, really opens it up and while this might be a little bit it seems a little bit uncontrasted it it's all about what I said before the colors are handled in a more natural looking way and it's a lot easier to add contrast to an image than it is to take away from it so that's why I set this to high contrast I feel like it gives me a good balance between nice contrast free image and it, it makes me feel like I'm working with a camera rather than a render in a lot of cases. And I always, I've always liked photography. It's always been sort of a hobby as well. So uh, for me, it feels more a natural way of doing things. And uh, I think with that, I'm actually going to wrap it up. So I hope this was interesting overall. Um, I, again, thanks for waiting. It's been, I know it's been a long time since I've posted anything, but I hope this was somewhat enlightening. Um, like I said, don't fall into the trap of thinking there's perfect render settings. Don't go copy mine and just use them for everything. I always tweak, I'm always looking at what I can turn on and off to get some performance versus how good my image looks. For me, the most important thing are these light paths. The defaults, uh, in my opinion, just aren't that great. I know why they're there because they don't want people rendering for like three days for a single image on, on an older computer. It's very normal, but if you have if you have either the patience or the machine to, to render it, um, or both even in some cases, then mess around with these. Because turning these up, yes, it will make your render slower, but a slower render isn't necessarily a bad thing. If it looks better, then it doesn't matter if it was slower. There's still op other optimizations you can do. And um, yeah, again, branched path tracing, you can get into that uh, if you combine it with all those passes and then you can tell the renderer, okay, so this in, uh, diffuse indirect pass is the one causing the most noise. So let's add more, more samples into those diffuse passes, into those bounces. And that's all just ways of controlling it. Again, there's so much documentation about this stuff online that isn't always super technical and it's something really interesting to get into. So if you're interested, try this stuff out, mess around with it, have fun with it. But most of all, try to figure out what it's doing and for yourself as well so you know what's going on in the render. Um, and with that, that's that. Um, yeah, I'll do a separate video about what's what's going on with the channel as well, but this is gonna be the last episode in Weird Shit Season 1. And the reason I'm ending it here is I think 10 episodes is a nice nice place to end, and Season 2 of Weird Shit, it's definitely coming back, but I'm gonna wait until 2.8 is out because a lot of stuff has changed. There's gonna be a lot of interesting co topics to cover, um, and I think the Weird Shit episodes are the perfect platform for that. So thanks for sticking with me. I hope you've enjoyed this one as well. I hope it was useful. Again, let me know down below in the comments and all that um, what you think. And yeah, I'll see you next time. All right, bye-bye. <laughs>